separately or um, together to get into character and prepare for the scenes or anything like that? You mean just in general? Yeah, just in general. Like, are, are you, are you exercise, do you listen to music? I, I have a very specific method. Um, I really do. I've had it since before Supernatural. I memorize, so I read the scripts over and over and over and over and over again. Um, I have read through script 10, but I've read the outline for 11, 12, a dozen times at least. And then, so the way I, I try to approach the day, the coming day, is to pretend it's a movie I've seen a dozen times. Like we all have those movies or TV shows or songs where you know the next verse, the next scene, the next line, the next word. And so I try to get to that spot um, where I know what is going on in the scene. You know, if there's a scene about Sam going to the sword, then the scene's about Sam going to the sword. So Sam says to me, hey, I'm going to the sword. What do you get? Apples and oranges. Uh, why oranges? Well, I'm trying to serve you that. Well, what's we do today? Well, I, I, I like vitamin C. Well, I like vitamin C. So, and then, but that, the words don't really matter. It's more about who you are as a as a person, as a character, and blending them. For, so for me, I try and just make it like it's it's in the back of my head, like a dream. I just like that. Um, so I memorize my lines on the treadmill. Uh, that morning, I, I commit to whatever scenes we're doing that day. And then he and I will get to set and like hair and makeup or one of our trailers or blocking, kind of get through it and, and kind of do the logistics of it. Um, but yeah, and then you just kind of like bother me, you know? I don't read the script. The script reads me. You <laughs> check noise? Flying on set. <laughs> I, uh, I'm very, I, I'm, I'm actually the opposite of that. I, I will read the script one time, uh, but I will read it very, very slowly. Uh, a lot of times, I'll go back and I'll read one line three or four or five, six, seven times until I figure out the way that uh, I think it makes sense to me. Then I'll move on, and so it'll take me, you know, 40, 45 page script is usually what we have. Um, I'll spend an hour and a half reading it, um, and that's just because I'm, I'm, I'm not reading, I'm studying it, but I'll only do it once, and then, so I have the idea, and it just gets locked in there, and then when I show up on set, then, like he said, we'll read the lines a few times, uh, and, and then we'll go in and perform them, and for me, um, it leads, it kind of like, it leaves me available to allow for uh, uh, happy accidents and all of the little things to, to kind of um, present themselves in the scene. Because a lot of times, if I'm reading it, I'm studying it um, over and over and over, and I've seen this happen with you know, guest stars that will come on. They'll read the lines in the mirror so much that they've locked in exactly how they want to say this word, exactly how they want to say this line, and no matter what the person is doing opposite them, or how they're delivering their lines that would, that would change the way that they would deliver their lines, they're still saying it exactly the way. So they're not really even listening to me. They're just waiting for me to stop talking so that they can deliver their performance. But that wouldn't make sense, because what happens if I'm delivering a different performance than they had in their head is what they were reacting to. So it, in my mind, it, it, you know, overstep, he, he does it in general, I'm not saying he does this, but if, if, you, if you overdo it and you lock yourself into that, it can be, uh, it can be damaging, I think. It just doesn't yeah, leave yourself we, available for the creativity that happens. The flexibility, there's a, yeah. we've had several times, several times, in the last 14 years, where we will do a scene with a, a new guest star, and it'll be our coverage. So Dean is saying this, Sam is saying that, and the guest star is saying their lines. And then we'll turn around, and they are worse. <laughs> I'm like, hey, that worked right. And we'll look at each other like, shit, I wish they were just like going with flow. Because there's some bit of like, they're saying the dialogue, 
but they're, you know, you can learn how to hit a forehand in tennis, but if you have to dive for it, you can't hit the same forehand. So it's more about flexibility and learning to bomb and weaving and learning to like dance a little bit. Like you can learn the moves, but then, hey, this person doesn't move the same way you thought they would. Uh, so I think he and I kind of really thrive when we let people bring out the best in us as actors while remaining true to Sam. Don't expect a bunch of fastballs. Be ready for a curve. I think it was, uh, we were for years and years, for, from season one to two, two to three, three to four, even four to five and five to six, we were, we were always not sure if we were coming back for the next season. Um, now that doesn't mean that we hadn't done something that we were proud of, that, that doesn't mean that we didn't think that we had succeeded in what we had set out to do, because anybody that gets from uh, a seat, one season to another season, that's a huge success. The odds are so stacked in your favor, or uh, against you, uh, to, to fail. Uh, I don't know what it is today, but I know that when we got on air in season one in 2005, there was like an 86% failure rate for, for new shows. It's probably more than that now. So just the fact that we got on the air was, uh, was great, and the fact that we stayed on the air was even asking even more on it. So yeah. I think it was little by little throughout the years when we kept coming back, and we kept coming back, and they moved us around in the schedule, in the lineup, in the week. As they, and, they, and they put us in slots that were not favorable at all. And it was, you know, some of these slots that we went to were where they put shows to die. And we didn't die. You guys kept us alive. I want to say there was a text message, like, it's seemingly random, but there's a backstory. I think Jensen texted me one time, hey, the rest of my tooth just fell out. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was when we were at our flight club moment, like, slap me. <laughs> at one point in time, I don't know what's going on, but he's like, I'm tired, man, slap me. I think he meant, like, this, you know, like, I'm being, he goes, slap me, so without thinking. <laughs> And it wasn't like a, it was with his meat of his So it was more of, it was more punch-like, really. And I mean, full, like, just, just like, came from Kentucky. And it's like, Wham! And, I, and it, it took me, it was like, shocking. You know? Woke him up. <laughs> yeah, not only did it wake me up, all of a sudden I was like, Just knocked half my bowl around. <laughs> yeah, I'm still going. It's, you know, like the, you know, your bowler has like four points to it. Yeah. Minus three. <laughs> Point Jared. <laughs> <Thanks. laughs> what was your first impression of Misha? And then Jared, can you do your best impersonation of Misha? Because that's what I had him do for you. <laughs> So this was essentially the first time I met Misha. It was on set, and we were just about to. <laughs> and we were just about to uh, to rehearse the scene where the character is introduced for the first time, where he comes into the barn and the lightning, and um, and so I didn't really get a chance to meet him because I was working uh, shooting a scene with Jim Beaver, and. Um, uh, so all of a sudden they just bring this new this new guy on set. They're like, you know, we're just gonna get right into a rehearsal, we'll block out the scene. I'm like, okay, great. So then basically this is what happened. I raised you from perdition. <laughs> so I did that, had the scene, and my my face was. And then I quickly uh, found Jared, and I was like, "Hey, man, how's the? Uh, you you worked with that new guy, right? What's it, Misha? Misha? I don't really know how to say it. Um, 
I don't know how to pronounce his name. What's, what's it? But it good? apparently it's not even his name. So, um... <laughs> Wait, so he chose a fake name and it's Misha? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I don't know. Weird, it, it, but with, with more on is I think he's got, like, throat cancer or something. <laughs> <laughs> Something's going on. With, with, can I give you a hand? Can I... You need some help? It worked. Hey, that's hey, a street 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 wardrobe. Wardrobe. Can we... Okay. Yeah, he oh, loses the shoe quite a bit. So cut to, we're walking through the parking lot, and we're just cruising so back. So what's it like? What's, what's this mission? I don't know, he's just, oh my gosh, he's right there. He's, <laughs> he's right there, and he's really, really odd. He's looking at us. <laughs> That's legit. We walked, we walked up, he was like sitting, it was like a Stephen King movie. He was like sitting on the edge of a, of a truck. Yeah. He was just like this, like sitting on a truck. Like, but on the, on the bed, like on the flat deck of a truck where like grips store their equipment, he has a perfectly good trailer right next door. <laughs> but he's sitting on the back deck of this, this, this flatbed. As we walk by talking, and we just like walk by, he's like, yeah, this, oh, he's right there, he's right there, he's right there. <laughs> I think he was in character or something. True story. Nothing's changed. First episode of season two, remember that? First episode of season two, after the car accident, when we're all sitting out there on the field, and the ambulance is there. It was this big setup, this big shot, and Sam's going like, where's my brother? You know, he's trying to, he's freaking out, and he's in the stretcher, and it was a July day in August, it was a very hot day, and I had spent like two hours, possibly more, getting prosthetic uh, uh, eye pieces to make it look like I had a bulging black eye, you know? Um, and the idea was that I, you know, my eye at the steering wheel, and so they put, like they use in boxing movies, like Ali and stuff, he had prosthetic, and he got punched in the eye. So, spent a couple hours doing it, and then it's time to shoot, it's this big setup, it's Kim Manners directing, and you want to do the best job for him, and he has these beautiful shots. But they had me waiting, laying in the gurney, because it was just between takes, and the sun melted the glue. So I'm laying there, and the, all of a sudden I'm like, oh, my eye is just killing me because the glue that held the prosthetic to my face was melting into my eyeball. And I could feel it, yeah. And so that's why being in the scene, actually, they now have an eye patch on me. Because they were like, we have to clean his eye out, but we don't have two and a half hours to put the pieces back on. So they put a big eye patch on me instead. But, I mean, I was like, well, there's three hours of sleep. I'll never get back for nothing. Um, so when something like that, or the Bloody Mary, when, the, when it was crying tears, it was a tube that went up my back, over my ear, and then to, the, to my tear duct, like this very finite tube, um, so that they could pump blood. And those, so that kind of stuff, you can't forget it's on, because there's a guy following you around, like who's holding the blood attached to <laughs> <laughs> Would you ever want to do a part two to my bloody Valentine? Sure. My blood. <laughs> my bloody Valentine? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I would. I think we left it, well, we, they left it open for there to be a, a sequel, but I, uh, the phone hasn't rang, so. The phone has rung. <laughs> <laughs> He's just been upset working. Ring? Rung it? Rung it? Ring it. Ring it. The phone has ringed. But he was on set eating coin out. But yes, I, I, I'd say that there is, uh, it is, yeah, it, it's, it happens quite frequently. Not that we're reading stuff and we're like, oh, my character would never say that. I'm just going to change it. It is, look, the writers do an amazing job and they write incredible stories and they write fantastic dialogue and it's, you know, we're, we're lucky to, to, to have the crew and the team that we do. Um, but it is a, there's a very great relationship that, we have with the writers, and, and that is uh, based on trust. We trust that they want the best for our characters in the, in the show, and they trust that we will perform it to the best that we can. If there's a line in there, or if there's a, uh, uh, an action in there that is written on the page that maybe the writer was thinking fit that moment, but then when we get it on its feet, we say it out loud, or we perform the action, physically and it just doesn't make sense for the character, it doesn't make sense for the particular scene or story, um, they have entrusted us to make those adjustments 
needed. Uh, and I think that that's probably a rare thing on yeah, the, the entertainment industry. I mean, I. He and I, a lot of times that people would have to yeah. phone to the writer's office, you know, you have to call people. And sometimes we're shooting at like midnight on a Friday and everybody's, everybody in LA is asleep. And yeah. we're like, well, this, you know, these lines are just not making sense now that we're saying it out loud. Yeah. Do you think I wanted to scream like that when that cat jumped out of her mouth? That did not serve Jensen at all. But it served the story and it served the show. And I did it. I must say that there is a, a, a there is a certain a difference in if somebody yells uh, Jensen or somebody yells D, and the difference is subtle. But this is what it would look like. You yell it out. Yeah, Jensen. That's one. Here's two. D. It's vocal. Give me a Jensen Dean.